A runner must be very careful not to slip when running. The type of track and the type of shoes matter a lot. Why is that? When a runner makes contact with the ground, ideally his shoes will grip the surface of the track without slipping. In this sense, we say that the shoe and the ground are in static contact, meaning that they are not sliding against one another. The reason behind this static contact is not visible to us without a very powerful microscope. If we look very carefully at the surface of the shoe and track, we will see microscopic indentations and ridges. These interlock between the shoe and the track, preventing a slip. As you can see, if we alter the type of shoe, we get different amounts of spikiness. Likewise, if we alter the type of track, we see different types of indentations in the ground. We are exaggerating the size of these indentations to make the physical point. The better the shoes and ground interlock at the atomic level, the less likely the runner is to slip. The runner moves forward, leftward here, by applying a horizontal force to the track. This pushes the track rightward, and the third law pair force pushes the runner leftward, accelerating him. The greater the force the runner attempts to push off with, the more likely the runner will slip, and the more grip is required. We can adjust the amount of grip by playing with the type of track and shoe, but there is another factor the grip depends on. Each time the foot comes to rest on the ground, it hits the ground with some impact force. The shoe pushes down on the track, and the track pushes up on the shoe. In physics classrooms, we call this upward force the normal force. We say normal because it is a synonym for perpendicular, and the force is perpendicular to the surface of the track. The greater this contact force, the greater the grip between the shoe and the track, and the greater the available friction force. Should the runner attempt to push off the ground with a horizontal force that exceeds the maximum static friction force available, known as the slipping limit, the runner will slip. The runner is not always at the slipping limit. Sometimes the amount of friction provided by the shoe track interface is less than the maximum allowed. This means the runner is well within his limits and not close to slipping. Let's look closely at the two graphs. In the left-hand graph, we have the slipping limit on the vertical axis and the impact or normal force on the horizontal axis. The slipping limit is the dependent variable. Greater impact force allows for a greater maximum slipping limit. Likewise, the slipping limit can be increased by altering the type of shoe or track. The right-hand graph is a bit more complicated, but worth understanding through careful examination. The vertical axis plots the frictional force available to the runner. Ideally, this would equal the horizontal force applied by the runner to the ground, so that the shoe doesn't slip. Let's see what happens if the horizontal force applied to the runner exceeds the maximum value, the slipping limit. As you can see, when we exceed the slipping limit, the amount of available force drops. This is because the shoe is now sliding along the track rather than interlocking with it. The force is not zero because the collisions between the spikes and indentations provide some resistance to motion. But at this point, we are in the kinetic friction regime, not the static friction regime, and the runner is in real trouble.